Okay, um, now we will have the first sharing. It's hold by Ashana and and who's the customer success architect at Mulesoft? Yeah. Hi, Hi Eric. Can you hear me? Okay, Ashana. Hello. Yeah, I can Hi, hear you can right you? now. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Very, yeah, very okay. And she will show us how to do some API mocking. Yeah, to mock some API yeah. with some uh, some best practice. Yeah, in this sharing. Okay, thanks. It's your awesome. show time. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ashna, and today I'm going to talk about API mocking best practices. Now, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm a customer success architect at MuleSoft. What it means is that I help my customers um, get the most out of the MuleSoft products. And before I joined MuleSoft, I have worked as an integration developer in at different companies in New Zealand, um, building APIs for banking, airline, and different industries. So that's where I'll be sharing my, my learning experience from. If you'd like to connect, I've got my contact details here, so feel free to reach out. Um, now, I know you've had a long day of API talks, um, and I'm hugely aware of the fact that I'm between you and a much-deserved break. So I kept the agenda simple and easy for on information. Um, we'll just talk about what is API mocking, why use API mocking, different type of mocks, um, different tools that, that are available for mocking, and some do's and don'ts from when I have used API mocking and what I've learned from that. So let's jump into it. So what is API mocking? So in a simple scenario, you would have an API that you are building or someone has built, and it would be talking to either backend systems or different APIs or different data source. And ideally, there will be an API client that calls that API to send a request and receive a certain response back. Now, let's say for whatever reason, the API is not available or is not reliable. What you can do is instead of calling the API directly, you can redirect the API client to use some mocks. Mox is obviously a predefined sample response, and it mimics whatever the API would have returned if it was available. Um, so API clients can use the mock directly. And so that, that's simplified um, API mocking. There are a few different versions of doing that as well. So you could do API virtualization, there's stubbing, and all these other options. But we'll just talk about the simple mocking in this case. So why use API mocking? There are a few different reasons why you would want to use uh, this mocking practice. And for example, let's look at decoupled development. So let's say, for exa example, um, I'm working for a bank and I'm building a borrowing calculator API that calculates how much a customer can borrow based on their profile. And in order to, in order for my API to return that value back, um, I would need to get the customer account using, let's say, an accounts API. Now, if that accounts API is not available, it is still in development or is, is just not available to me, I don't have access to it, what I can do is mock the response from the API, accounts API and use it to develop my borrowing calculator API so that I can continue my development while the accounts API is being developed as well by some other team or some other company, um, don't know. Uh, the other option is design first approach. You would have heard of that a lot in API world, obviously, uh, where you create the API specification first, you socialize it, you get the feedback on it early on, and then you do your API implementation. So in this case, um, having those mocks helps you understand what those sample responses would look like, helps you get that feedback, that rapid feedback as well. And this helps you in having those implementation go in the right directions in the first instances, rather than doing um, more reactive and more bug fixings at the later on stages. Um, integration testing. So you would want to test your API when it connects to other APIs or other backends, but in ideal, in ideal scenario, that would all work. But in real cases, you might not have those APIs available. So what you can do is instead of calling those real endpoints, you can use mocks of those APIs and, and test your API in, in isolation. Um, as such. It is also useful for isolated scenario testing. So what I mean by that is, for example, let's go back to the borrowing calculator. Um, let's say you have an algorithm as part of that API. And depending on the different account balance um, or the range of account balance, it gives you a different output. And you want to test those different scenarios. But the test customer that you're using for accounts API gives you the same account balance all the time, right? Um, so what you can do is have different mocks that would give you the account balance you're looking for in the different ranges and use those mocks for your borrowing calculator so that you can have those scenarios tested as well. 
and unstable systems. Like that's probably like the most, um, I guess, time spent on blockers when, when you have unstable systems or unstable environments, which is when the, the backend systems or the APIs that you're relying on um, are not available in the environment you are testing. And this is often the case in case of um, development environments or testing environments that are being shared with other teams as well across the organization. organization. So in that case, you could use mocks to, to relieve that dependency on other APIs or other systems for you to continue on your testing and development. And sometimes things are out of your control. So external dependencies, um, if you are talking to any third-party applications, third-party APIs, or any partner APIs, you can't necessarily control the amount of uh, the response that they send back or the variation of those responses. In that case, again, you can use mocks to do those variations. And sometimes those third-party APIs can incur costs. So for example, you're limited on the number of um, calls you can make on that API, especially in test environment. Um, you would want to, if you're limited, for example, to just 1,000 calls a day, um, you don't want to keep on bombarding that and use up that limit. You, you could just use a mock survey in between that returns the same response that you would have got from the test API on third party, and then just use those mocks instead of going to the, to the third party instead. So now that we've looked at whys, uh, let's look at some different types of mocks. So simple one is static mocks. In this case, you would basically not go to API at all. And you would, in, in all the cases, you'd use the static mocks. That's what the name means, that you're not actually talking to the real live endpoint, but you are just using those mock responses. It doesn't mean that those static mocks can't change. You can have multiple responses that are returned based on the request parameters. So for example, if I say, if I have a flag in my request that says negative, then the account API response in my case should return a negative balance. And that all can be set up in your, in your static mocks as well. It just means that the values that you get in those responses are going to be static. So they won't change as you change your request. And the second one is record replay. How this works is that um, instead of using those static mocks or instead of just talking to those static server, um, you're talking to a mock server that has the capability of talking to your real endpoint or real API that you are trying to mock. Um, how this works is, let's say, for, for example, the API client calls the mock server, and then it doesn't have the response that the API client is looking for, a specific request parameters or a certain criteria that you would want to satisfy. What it would do is it would call the real API endpoint, get the response back, and then send the same response back to API client before storing it in the mock server um, database. And then the next time you call the mock server for the same request parameters, it's just going to return the same response back to you rather than going to the API. Um, this type of mock uh, helps you keep your mocks a little bit more current. Um, it helps you get the most um, refreshed version of it and more latest version of that API uh, response. So in case things have been continuously changing for that API, if the API specification has changed or things like that, you are, get, you are able to get the most um, current response back. And it also helps you that uh, speed up that part where you don't have the reliability of, so you don't have to rely on the, on the actual API endpoint the whole time. Um, what are the different mocking tools you can use for this? So I'll share the couple of uh, tools that I've used personally. So one of them is Bond Bank. Um, it's a it's a mock server that you can spin up in your local machine. So what you do is you you deploy an instance of that in your local machine, and then you can use either Postman or any other um, uh, REST client tool uh, to create those stub responses and then set up the conditions that you would want to have on those stubs. It allows both static mocks, also it, it can do the record replay, so it can go back to the real endpoint and, and fetch the response for you if you want to set it up that way. It does provide a lot of flexibility in configuring those mock behaviors. So for example, um, when you're calling mock server, obviously because you're avoiding that network call where the API might be hosted, um, you, you might not experience as much delay as you would in, in case of real API, right? So you might want to configure that delay factor in your mock responses as well. So that's something you can do with uh, with the mock server or the Mount Bank server. Um, it also allows you to say, okay, you want to randomize those responses that are coming back. So then you can say, okay, the first two times I call with the same request, give me the same response. But the third time I call, give me this different response. And all of this can be configured in Mount Bank as well. Um, it's easy setup. As I said, you can just do a Postman REST call and it will set that stub up for you. 
It also allows for multiple different protocols. So there's HTTP, HTTPS, TCP, and SMTP as well, if I'm correct. And um, yeah, so it's very simple. It's easy to see. And the latest I checked, there's also like a UI available for Montbank. So you can go and see what stubs you have set up and, and what responses are being returned from that as well. Um, similar one is Mock Server, uh, very similar to Montbeck. Uh, the, other, the only difference is that it allows different ways that you can use Mock Server. So, for example, you can use the REST API, same, same as Montbank, um, but you can also deploy it as a standalone Java application or a JavaScript application, um, which you can obviously modify and, and create, configure so that you can have the mocks that you're looking for. Allows the same static mocks and record replay. Plus, also there's some other options where you can also verify the response you are getting back um, and and uh, other other options. For example, the one shown here, which is a callback action. So you can it can do the request matching, then call the callback action, and then create the dynamic response and return it back to you. Uh, there's also a UI for debugging um, for mock server, which which will help you um, see what mocks are being created and what is being returned as well. There's some other mocking tools. I haven't explored all of these, but um, there are some options if you want to look at. So for example, there's online servers where you can just, uh, you don't have to create an instance of yourself. Um, you can just create, you can just use those online servers and, and create the, your mock responses. So mocky and mockable. Um, other local servers apart from Montpeg and mock server is Wiremock, Mockoon, and Kilgrave. And you could also just use the embedded services and style inside the testing tools like Postman and Stopfy. So they allow you um, multiple options to, to mock your responses as well. Um, some do's and don'ts. Uh, this is again from my experience. So I hope you um, relate to those. Um, mocks need to match the specifications. So for example, if you go back to accounts API, let's say your account number is um, being returned in an integer, but um, it would make sense for you to have that as a string. If, if that's what your specification says, make sure that the mock response has that as a string as well, or vice versa, whichever data type has been defined. Or for example, if it is Boolean, then instead of true, it's not saying true as a string. Um, you want to make sure that these are correct because um, whoever is consuming those mocks is basing their implementation on, on these mocks. So you want to have it as correct as possible. Negative testing. So often when we're creating mocks, um, we just focus on the positive results or the or the 200 responses. Um, we often forget about the 400, 500 responses and what the error response would look like in that case. So mock servers give you that good opportunity to have those responses configured as well. So you can let your consumers know beforehand what those responses are going to look like and what is the kind of information or message they'll have um, in, to, in order to consume those errors. So don't be afraid to put some negative tests in your mocks over. Um, mocks go stale. So obviously, if your API specification has changed, but if you haven't changed your mocks responses, then, then that's going to affect um, the consumer more. And that's why you want to, every time your API specification has updated, you do want to make sure that the mocks are updated as well. Or if some of the sample responses that you've got or the values that you've got are no, no longer making sense, for example, the enum values that you have in there have changed um, and things like that, then you want to make sure that those are updated as well. Um, it's very tempting when you're configuring your mocks to, to um, go as hard as you can and, and configure all the different options you can have on your mocks on, on matching those requests and, and having those mocks with like the delays and, and the dynamic values it can have in, in that. Um, I'll just remind you, if you're doing that, then, then you do want to keep in mind that there is a flexibility, usability trade-off that you should consider. Um, I love this image, which is about a bulk rename um, utility. It's a simple task that you're trying to do, but there's so many options, and it almost becomes um, not usable or not user-friendly, at least. And um, so you, you want to have that balance between how flexible you want your mock server to be and how usable it ends up being. Along the same lines, um, remember that mock server, when you set that up, it's a maintenance effort. Uh, you'll have to put as much effort as you do in your API development. Um, so if you want to reduce that effort, make sure that you set it up in a way that 20% of the effort you put in the mock server gives you 80% of the results. Uh, you won't be able to configure all the mocks that you need. So make sure that you focus on that 80% result uh, rather than the other way, which is putting in the 80% effort and only getting the 20% result out of it. So having that balance on what, what to mock and what not to mock would be important here. So to sum it up, um, make sure the mocks are accurately matching to the API specification. 
make sure your mocks are current and regularly updated, um, as, as ideally as quickly as APS specifications are updated. Um, use record replay if you can. That um, helps you with, with having those mocks being as latest as possible, as current as possible. Don't over-engineer it. Um, it's very tempting, I can tell you that. Um, find a balance between what to mock and what not to mock. Uh, again, you won't be able to configure a full-fledged API response out of mocks. Um, so you do want to consider what are the scenarios that are most relevant for you to mock and and what what don't don't make sense. And don't forget to test for the negative test cases and and in, in respect um, error handling as well because um, that, that's that's where mocks are more helpful as well. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you found something useful there. And uh, I'll see if I have any questions now. OK. Um, can you show us what is the pros and cons of the mocking the, uh, mocking the API instead of just prepare the, some testing data in, let's say, the database? Um, yeah, so you can, those are the static mocks, so you can definitely have those, but what happens is that if your API specification changes, then you would have to go in and change those fields in the database or the responses yourself. Um, if you were using record replay, for example, then you could just call the real endpoint or you could invalidate that response and it would just go and call the real endpoint, get the proper response back and then store that as your mock response. So I guess it's just um, the way that you're doing manual effort versus um, automatically retrieving those responses. Mm -hmm. What is the challenge that you faced before when you prepared the the the, the API mocks? What is the ch most challenging things? Yeah, as I said, like I think um, the main challenge I had is is to um, is to decide what to mock and what not to mock, or how to how simple I want to keep my mocks, or how smart I wanted my mock server to be, um, because I was like, okay, if the date is different, then I want to configure that date, and then my dynamic response should have that updated date, and things like that. And you you end up doing a lot more, um, I guess, configuration in your mock server than than you than you need to. Um, so you need to just remember that the effort that you put into creating that mock server or the functionality that you add to that mock server needs to be maintained because when things change, you'll have to come back and change the mock server settings as well. So just having that balance is is a little bit difficult. But um, and try and try and use that same mock server for a different application. So at least the effort that you put in to setting that up is is at least used in other cases as well, rather than using it for just one or two isolated scenarios. In general, the C level, I can say the C level, we think that okay, API mocking is it costs a lot for for the, for the course, yeah. And then what is your suggestion, and then how to present it to to the C level, that okay, API yeah. mocking is good, and what's the benefit? What should we, what what can we do? Yeah, I, I guess you're um, talking from like the time um, effort yes. that you need to to set that up. Yeah, so um, there's definitely some effort you would need to put in to set this up early on. But as I said, like if you were not doing that, there's a lot more time being wasted in making sure that the real endpoint is returning the response or it's available all the time. And it's just it's just um, hinders your development a lot of times that and if you count all of the time that is being wasted on that, I think that effort that you put on mock server is justified um, in setting that up once rather than having that time being wasted multiple times. Okay. Okay, thanks for your sharing today. And I hope that all of the attendees can learn more, learn something from you today in the sharing. I hope so. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for having me.